So welcome everyone. And um, so today, I think you all have the, you have your little program, but it's on the topic of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which is the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, and towards a culture of peace. So we're linking culture of peace um, as well as uh, 1325. And I just wanted to like, give uh, uh, some uh, audience participation beforehand, just a little bit to engage us because we're transitioning between two different meetings. But um, I just want you to raise your hand to the answer, okay? So what do you think is the answer? So for 1325, um, those of you who think there are now currently um, over 100 national action plans, please raise your hand. Over. You think there are over a hundred? Okay, great. So, um, those of you who think we have uh, under 50. Okay. So, those of you who think it's in between 50 and 100. Okay, playing it safe. Because <laughs> I didn't say anything about 150 and over. So you know we're not there yet. No. We're at 82, 83, 83, and nine more coming next year. So that's where we're at. I just kind of wanted to, um, us to be aware of that before. And, um, and then I'm going to sit down since everybody else is sitting. To make them comfortable. Yeah. I don't think they need that. But. Um, so the NGO CSW is um, holding monthly meetings this year. Um, we really want to focus on the six thematic uh, clusters. So this month, of course, it's on peaceful and inclusive societies. And that's how we kind of structured it for this coming year. So every month you're going to hear about a different cluster of the Beijing Plus 25. I think you must be all aware of this. The study group definitely should be aware of it. So um, 19 years ago, that was the 31st of October, member states adopted so, uh, Security Council Resolution 1325. And so next year is gonna be a, a 20th anniversary. And, uh, but a year prior, which was in uh, 19, uh, well, I, know, I, I can't do the math right now. Mm -hmm. But this year is the 20th anniversary of uh, Declaration and Program for Action on a Culture of Peace. When you walked in today, you should have seen the little booklets. That's the actual resolution with the eight action areas, a program of action within it. And um, that was adopted a year prior to 1325. And they're very linked and they should probably, there's definitely synergy in it. And so it seemed quite appropriate since it's the 20th anniversary to focus on this topic. And um, actually at the uh, United Nations, the President of the General Assembly has convened a high-level forum on the culture of peace since 2012, actually. And they just had it last month. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has attended that, but that just took place, actually, last month, September 13th on the anniversary day, actually. And um, the other linkage, actually, is that uh, Ambassador Chaudhry was a link between the two, too. He actually was behind both initiatives. And I wanted to mention that um, here I have today as a panelist is, um, I, please excuse me because I might say something wrong, but Ambassador Bo Boyer. 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 <laughs> and um, Monica. A year next to her. And actually, the ambassador was uh, at two of the high level forum on culture peace. She spoke on that. Um, I thought, you know, this is one of the things she's passionate about. She promotes culture of peace, among many, many other things. Um, I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we were at the Hungarian mission, um, and you were so kind to host a woman of distinction, not woman of distinction. Ambassador Luncheon. Yeah, Ambassador Luncheon. 
Um, so thank you for that. And they're not very far from here, so it seemed like <laughs> it was pretty convenient. But um, I wanted to mention something that was uh, talked about at this year's uh, High Level Forum on Culture and Peace. I find it really appropriate because it was Lima de Bowie who spoke. Um, she was not the keynote, but she made a special statement. And within that, I'm quoting, well, it's not a direct quote, but um, she was really challenging everyone there on how we see peace. And she said that culture of peace is not an abstract concept. And she said it'll take a radical transformation and that for UN, you know, to deliver peace is actually a myth. It's um, because the UN is made up of member states and that it, ultimately it's up to each of us as individuals to uphold peace every day. So that was like the message. Um, again, I find it very encouraging, you know, that I could do something for this. Um, and I wanted to say, because I know you already have the bios with you, the program, but there were some few other things I wanted to add within that, because I'm going to turn to uh, the ambassador to speak. But um, that she started her career as a theater and music critic and television broadcaster. And she um, started her political career in 1999, working for the Hungarian Ministry for Culture and opened the Hungarian Cultural Center in London. And she was State Secretary, Secretary of Hungary for Education and Culture, responsible for like UNESCO and UNESCO National Commission as well. And I know she also has places important on dialogue, if I remember correctly. But uh, I had asked them already questions to consider before coming here today, so I'm just gonna say those questions um, and then I'm gonna just let them, you know, talk. Oh, I'm sorry, but UN women <laughs> could not make it. Uh, but we really hope to learn from them. I was gonna mention a few things about um, what they have produced recently that I think we should study. Uh, I'll mention that a little later. But, uh, so this was my question. So, member states have agreed on the culture of peace as a, you know, resolution, GA resolution, yet many are not aware or do not take the agenda seriously. So how can we tackle this challenge? And what ideas do you have to advance this agenda and to link it to the Security Council Resolution 1325? And how can a culture of peace help help advance this women, peace, and culture agenda? And how does Beijing plus 25 fit into all of this from your perspective? So thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. But first of all, it's nearly impossible to pronounce my name, I know. <laughs> because Bojari is a very Hungarian name, and we have the uh, sound Gye, it's like the Magyars, so um, you mentioned that I started my life, professional life as a journalist, a television broadcaster, working with not only Hungarian, but I was a broadcaster in England. Excuse me, could you please speak louder? Closer, yeah, just yes. hold it closer. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you hear me now? Now it's better, thank yeah? you. Yeah, okay. Thank so you. when uh, you mentioned that I started my uh, professional career as a journalist, in the printed press and then in television. And when I, whenever I was uh, broadcasting from abroad for uh, English uh, channels and when I lived in London, they were pronouncing my name always differently. So, you know, like, Gatali Bogai presenting or reporting, and it was Bogai, Bogai, Bogai. So I said, wow, you know, and you are one person having so many names. <laughs> But uh, of course, your name is a different, difficult issue when you have an international career. Now, when we talk about uh, this very important issue, and uh, first of all, I apologize because I have to make today three speeches. So I came here, first of all, because I know your work. Uh, I've been twice awarded by your wonderful award. And, um, and I was very happy to welcome you. I remember it was in the first year. She was in the same thing when I came here. Uh, and I came here to, to meet you 
all because I believe that the work that we do at the United Nations is one part of the work. work. Of course, the United Nations is an intergovernmental organization. We always have to understand that whatever is UN is intergovernmental. But then it's so important for us to have an outreach and to have our partners. First, who can inspire us. Second, who we can work with. Um, and I think your organization uh, established itself as a very influential uh, uh, organization. So for all of us who think that your work is instrumental. So I want to really to congratulate you. Now, uh, after I, I collected my thoughts for this topic, but after that I'm sorry I have to leave because then I'm going to speak about how to protect people who are persecuted because of their religion. Mm. You know, we have uh, the General Assembly going on in the third committee, I'm going to talk about that. But um, uh, when you talked about my career, you said that I was the Secretary for Education and Culture. But why is this culture of peace so, so close to my heart and why I said immediately, and even in these crazy times? It is because uh, I used to work for Federico Mayor. Federico Mayor was UNESCO uh, Director General, and I used to work for him in 1998-1999. And then later on I became UNESCO Ambassador of my country, and I became the President of UNESCO General Assembly for two years. And Federico Mayor was the person who, the very first time, put together the program for the culture of peace. So I've been there really from the beginning, uh, and I've been following that, and I've been very actively talking about this, because of course it has got so many layers, so many levels, when you talk about culture of peace. When I was the president of UNESCO uh, General Assembly, one of my priorities was really to fight <coughs> together with everybody for the culture of peace. And of course, culture of peace, you know, it, it is, it is a, it's a notion which can be understood in different ways. So what I would like to do now, uh, collected uh, my thoughts, as I said, to show you some important aspects which I think all belong to the culture of peace as a notion. First of all, I heard you were talking about action. You know, have you heard about Betty Williams? Betty Williams was this amazing, um, Northern Ireland, I from this amazing politician from Northern Ireland, uh, who got actually the Nobel Peace Prize as well. Uh, and actually, she said, peace is not words, peace is action. So we have to work very hard for that. It's not enough just to think about that. Um, this was this very important and very interesting example building peace, making peace, fighting for peace, when these peaceful demonstrations in Northern Ireland actually led by Betty Williams uh, took place. And first of all, I would like to talk about, when I talk about uh, women and uh, culture of peace, I would like to talk about women as survivors. It has been long been recognized that women and children suffer disproportionately in any crisis. We just know that. So there are not only a greater risk of physical harm, suffer mentally and emotionally, livelihood, financial security, but they can also lose their future prospect as well. I'm sorry that uh, no colleague is here from UN Women at the moment, but I'm also the Vice President of UN Women Executive Board. And of course, within the UN Women, we work very hard, and again, in a togetherness with the NGOs and the civil society for, for women who are survivors. Women, we believe, need full and fast support through a survivor-centered approach that is both personalized and community-based and serves all who have been affected by violence. Assistance should cover imminent needs, such as healthcare and psychosocial support, shelter and access to justice, 
and also long-term help, including legal and social economic support to the survivors and also to their children. We've seen uh, many examples how important it is. Just lately, I was in the Caribbean islands where, you know, sadly, uh, there are many survivors and uh, there are many bad actions uh, against women. And that kind of shelters and legal support uh, by the government, by the NGOs and the civil society are really very, very important. But we must understand that the female survivors of violence are betrayed not only by those who directly harm them, but also by the international community who really fail to be proactive, to understand and prevent a humanitarian conflict and to build a support mechanism. So it is really our responsibility, I believe, to give back the dignity of these people, to help them to come forward and to talk about that, and to mobilize people who are around them and who are helpful, and who are willing to talk, stand up, and help. So it is not easy for survivors, we know, to come up. So when we talk about the culture of peace, first of all, we have to think about the women, you know, how they can build their own surrounding in a peaceful manner if they are going through torture. So, uh, I always say that women are really the agents of change, and I'm sure you all agree uh, that we can do really a serious difference in the world. We can do as women, but I believe we can do together with men. I'm happy to see there are some men, right, mm -hmm. in, the, in the room. I, uh, hello, it's great to have you here. <laughs> I'm telling you why. I, um, I've been working, uh, as you see uh, from my bio, for decades um, uh, on these matters. And I realized that uh, it is important that we have a support system, we women. I set up the Circle of Women Ambassadors at the UN. This is very important, and our male colleagues keep asking us, what are you talking about in these circles? <laughs> and I said, well, we are all at the moment 49 and 50, which is already a critical mass out of 193. You know, it is not a bad number, but we are still in the minority. So I keep telling my colleagues, male colleagues, that the time you will be in minority, you can have your circle. <laughs> at, the moment, at the moment, we need our circle because we need to share, to understand, to support each other. On the other hand, it's very important that we have got two other movements. One is the International Gender Champion Movement. Me as an International Gender Champion, I'm very happy to support the whole concept that we, everybody, all of us, we are responsible for our actions. So if we believe that we are International Gender Champions, and they can be men and women, it's not only for women, you know, we can make decisions. We would not really come to a panel at, unless it is equal. At the moment, I see here a women majority, but, uh, but it's because of you and the organization. But for example, it's very important for us that whenever we talk about a topic related to women, we try to talk about these topics together with men. Mm -hmm. But whatever topic we are talking about in panels in the United Nations, we would like to see equal representations of men and women in the panel so that the dialogue should really be real. Uh, we also have a movement, it's called the He for She, probably you have heard about that. It means that we are very happy to work with men who believe in women. And I am a very uh, happy person because I was brought up by a father who was a he for she. I've got a husband for 36 years who is a he for she, and I'm happy to say that I raised a son who is a he Yay. for she. <laughs> and that's very important. <laughs> it is very important because um, your voices will be heard and can be heard, but if we really want to be successful, we have to find a man who are coming with us 
who are believing in us and who are doing the work with us. So when I say that women uh, are or have to be considered as agents of change, I really mean that because we can do so much, so much good and such a great change in the world. Now, women who are oppressed are so often forced to remain silent, and we know it causes a trauma. It causes a trauma for the women wherever they live in the world, probably even if it is for them not such a dramatic um, uh, life experience because they are raised like that, or this is the only way what they see around them, still it's a trauma inside. So women, I believe, are victims not only in a conflict. We have multiple examples before us to find women as active and strong players in history. So we have to remember that. In conflict affected areas, women are agents for peace, as I said, and their voice should be utilized in preventing and countering violent extremism. Grassroots peace initiatives of local women deserve more attention, and civil society and women-led organizations should be recognized partners in peace processes. Again, I would like to say just recently, as you and women uh, uh, vice president, I went to um, Colombia, and I met many women there who went through the war, who went through the trauma, who went through extremism, and. Uh, and all kinds of terrible dramas. But I've seen how they survive, and I've seen their legacy, how they turn the drama into a reality, a kind of memento to everybody, uh, to understand how to survive, to understand how to work around uh, uh, in, in your surrounding, so that it would never happen, so that it would be not repeated. So we need the grassroots organization, we need the women coming from the grassroots organization. If we really believe that the women are the agents of change, we have to give them the chance. But also it's very difficult, but it has to be something which starts inside. Mm. So we are here as organization, as the UN and you as an important NGO, helping these women. And that is why the outreach is so important so that you talk and you give the space in which they can come in. Uh, as uh, special envoys, heads of missions, peacekeepers, and deliverers of humanitarian aid, women are able to better reach out to specific parts of local communities and understand their concerns and build trust. Here I would like to stop just for a moment, because trust is something what is for us very important nowadays. Because what do we see? We see the lack of trust. We see the lack of trust everywhere. We see the lack of trust in the United Nations. This is one of the most difficult issues we are facing every day. So how on earth do we want to make peace? How on earth do we want to create the culture of peace if we don't trust each other? Uh, I also would like to remember that unfortunately, we also find women about among the ones who were radicalized. And we shouldn't remember why it happened to them. So the testimonies of some of them attest that they felt marginalized in their home communities and wanted to prove, them that, to prove themselves to be equal with men. This is also a very interesting issue. We talked about that at the Security Council, in the General Assembly, and obviously everywhere you just see these very interesting examples. But when we talk about culture of peace, uh, and we talk about women as the agents of uh, change, uh, I also would like to mention that women have an important role in sustainable peace. Um, so how can we expect to serve communities if we don't include half of them in conversation? This is the number one question for everybody who would like to see an important role of women in creating sustainable peace. I remember I went to Egypt many, many years ago, 
And of course, during the revolution in Egypt, you just saw the women being very vocal, very active, being on the square. They were really a moving force of the revolution. And uh, a year later, I organized a big conference at UNESCO in Paris with Boutros, Boutros Ghali, who used to be, you may know, uh, one of the Secretary Generals of the United Nations, who, who was a brilliant Egyptian politician. And I asked the question, you know, where are the women? Because we haven't seen them. So where are the women who made all these changes? So women often remain excluded from or restricted to discussions. And we believe that they can make changes, but then very often when the new structure is built up, they are again forgotten. So I would like to say that women are not victims. They are leaders, they are activists, they are educators who have valuable insight to offer. Whenever I speak in the world, they always ask me, you know, what, what, what is your driving force or, or what is your mantra? And I'm sure you all have your mantras. Every morning you get up, okay, why do I do what I do? And I, I just think that we have this tendency uh, having dreams, right? But we also have the tendency being optimist. And we have the tendency being an activist. So my mantra is have your dream, be an optimist, but be an activist. Because uh, otherwise you can't, cannot really, you, you are not able to achieve what is inside you and how you can make change and work towards the, 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 the culture of peace. So a, step, a sustainable and stable society is where women are not suffering from violence, where they have political rights, economic opportunities, and access to justice, and it is a more stable and resi resilient society. We know that it all comes together. A stable society is the prerequisite for progress, sustainable and inclusive development, where a wide array of society is empowered and no one is left behind. Um, we shouldn't really forget that women's talent should be fully utilized in political decision making. I remember the first time I welcomed Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, still back uh, at UNESCO, when he came to talk to us. Uh, I asked uh, your excellency, so where are the women you know, why are they not leading the peace talks? Because there are women, but very seldom they are leading the peace talks. I must say that by today, we have got a, 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 a really equal uh, proportion of women leaders on a senior level uh, management in the United Nations, which is a great experience for all of us. And this is really because of the firm belief of the Secretary General, uh, Mr. Guterres. Uh, but I never forget the moment I was in Kuwait uh, meeting the Foreign Minister and the Minister of Education in the Parliament. And then I just asked them, but you know, Excellencies, where are the women? And then they told the wife that there were three men over there. And I looked around and I didn't see one woman. I said, so where are the women? They said, over there, meaning <laughs> towards the corridor, somewhere in the back rooms. They are there, they are probably assistants, they are probably secretaries, but they didn't have the chance really to influence the, uh, the movements and the political decision making. So we really have to help the women to be part of the political decision making. Yes. Because very often we see, and we have a lot of problems in the UN Women, that there are so many stereotypes. And we really just have to understand that everyone has got the talent and the capacity to do all kinds of differences. But stereotyping uh, is something what is very difficult to fight. And that's why we have a lot of problems in the UN, and I'm sure that you know more about the UN you and probably than anyone else because you are looking at us all the time. And that's why I want to hear a little bit from you as well. But I think it's important that the, the, the
promotion of women in different uh, uh, situations in life is very important. So we work a lot to encourage women to do science, to become scientists. We have, we created since I'm here, the International Day of Girls and Women in Science. We would like more women be brave enough to apply for life journeys, which probably would have been not considered life journeys for women previously. Uh, actually, um, in my country, in, in Hungary, we created in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences a special program, Women in Science, and I think that's really working well because you know that if you have good examples, if you can find good, young, talented scientists and women and girls, if you can create good role models, uh, obviously it is very important. Just think about Laura, UNESCO, how important it is and how influential. So the so-called STEM participation of girls and women, young scientists is very important. Now, as I said that during the presidency of UNESCO, one of my uh, guiding principles was really to create uh, the culture of peace on every level of, of, uh, of our life. And um, uh, I, I realized that this is such a complex uh, issue because we all have to be very proactive in that, and we have to address the multidimensional root causes of conflicts through prevention, mediation, and protection of human rights. I'm always asked why do I think that women you know, have got such a great talent in building a culture of peace. And then I always say that I'm a diplomat, uh, what do I do? I see where you would like to go to. Now, normally, if you work together with men, they know that they want to get here, and then they would like to go that way. We can find different ways, right? For us, it's important that we got here. So obviously, it's very, very important to shoot immediately if I can't go immediately to the point I would like to. But I see working with a lot of uh, peacemakers, uh, mediators uh, who are women, that they have got probably uh, 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 a kind of approach which gives a bigger, probably a slower, but a bigger freedom of finding the ways how to really get to the point so that we can fight together and create the culture of peace. So I really think that the road to reach the culture of peace is not straight, and it's not even a road, more of a mental state, I would say. It is a mental state, because this is something what we all have to believe in. Now, late, uh, lastly, I just want to mention there are so many uh, aspects of the culture of peace, but I would like to mention one, what is very important, and this is the dialogue. You said that I'm committed to dialogue, yes, I am because I believe that number one is that we should really not only talk but listen to each other. I remember my first speech at the Security Council in 2015 when I came here. Uh, for months, of course, I was sitting there every day and listening and trying to understand what was going on. And you know, I just saw speakers coming in, reading a statement, leaving. I said, but how on earth? I mean, how do they at all know what the others is saying? Of course you can't be there all the time. Of course you can't be there all the time. But I remember at the Security Council, I was starting to talk about the lack of dialogue. And I was starting to talk about the need for us to listen to each other. Because this is number one, if we want to create a culture of peace. And normally in the Security Council, everyone is sitting there and sending messages and very seriously writing and reading. And when you sit at the Security Council table, you know, the audience is behind your back, right? 
this is the culture of the security company. So I was talking, talking, and I felt with my back that they stopped sending messages <laughs> and stopped sort of making noise with the papers. And they were thinking, who is this woman <laughs> talking to us about what we should do, mainly listen to each other. And then I felt I'm the right track. So uh, I think it's all on us to create the culture of peace, mm -hmm. and it's all on us joining, joining forces. That is why I believe so much in circles, because circle is a symbolism. In my country, a circle dance, you know, when they embrace each other and they dance together, I'm sure it is in Africa in many parts of the world, but there are these very special Hungarian circle dances, and these dances are the symbols of brotherhood, of sisterhood, of listening, and of working together. I am originally a musician, I am a pianist, and I just had to know how to combine, how to focus, how to use my fingers, how to use my legs, you know, how to use my brain, my intellect, and then I realized that's not enough. It's not enough, I just can play everything. But if you don't give your heart and soul into that, there is no music. And I think this is the same thing everywhere in the world. So I wish you all the very best, and thank you for being so active in the United Nations. <coughs> and not only during CSWU, because of course these crazy two I weeks are so like the General Assembly high level week, but this is an ongoing process. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, Circles is perfect also because this CSW we're going to have what we're calling conversation circles for three days. And it's going to be really an open space for civil society to really get together and talk about the issues um, so that we're not always the ones receiving but that we can actually listen and share with each other. So um, thank you for that connection to Circles and everything else you mentioned as being agents of change. And um, I'm not sure about your time. I have to, we have to leave. Yeah, okay. You don't mind. I, yes, religion, the freedom of religion is great. <laughs> <laughs> Which is as important as the, the peace. Culture of peace. Yes. Actually, it's part of it. Yes. So I hope to see you again. going to continue with the program and uh, Monica is here. Um, actually, Mavic uh, sends her uh, regards to everyone. She's in the Ukraine and uh, she's the CEO and founder of the Global Network, like Global Network on Women Peace Builders. And um, she couldn't be here, but uh, Malika, who was with us last year as well. Um, the topic last year was on young women's leadership at 1325 and 2250, which is the youth peace and security with the women peace and security agenda, which the linkage there is young women between the two. Um, and Malika is, I don't know, I'm gonna call her like an expert of CEDAW and um, women peace and security agendas. Actually, they have written a report on this very important linkage. I think it's important for us to be aware of it. And um, also, again, 2250, which is the Youth Peace and Security um, and the 1325 and Young Women's Leadership as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to her. But before that, I'm going to tell you uh, what I asked her to talk about. And these were my questions. Uh, beyond advocating for the women, peace, and security agenda, what are practical ways for individuals to get involved in implementing 1325? And what are findings from your civil society survey on perceptions on sustaining peace for local populations as it relates to a culture of peace? And how are multi-stakeholder collaborations and cross-sectoral partnerships important in this Especially with Beijing Plus 25, I, I was really curious on how we can really partner with unlikely partners. 
And what are the synergies between CDAW and 1325? And why is it so important? Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Ivy, and thank you, Hulu, as well. Do you want to pull it up? Maybe it's easier to just pull it up. Of course. Okay. Thank you so much to the NGO CSW for inviting me here for this monthly meeting. Um, it's as Ivy said, it's my second time here, and I'm glad to be back on to speak about such an important topic during an important advocacy moment, which is the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Declaration and Program for Action on the Culture of Peace, and also the 19th anniversary of the groundbreaking resolution, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. As I said, I represent an organization called the Global Network of Women Peace Builders a women's rights organization coalition, which represents civil society organizations across the world, mostly from conflict-affected countries. And our mission is to empower women to amplify their voices to build sustainable and inclusive peace. So this, this topic is right up our alley, and it's our bread and butter, and what we do every day. We think about it when we're sleeping, we're showering, eating, everything. Um, we eat, breathe, and Read uh, 1325. And, and my teacher. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, so, in our work, we emphasize the nexus between the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda with so many other important instruments, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Youth, Peace, and Security Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Culture of Peace, and the Sustaining Peace Agenda. These instruments are all incredibly important and interrelated, so they must be implemented together, not in silos, in order to generate the strongest political will, commitment, and accountability from member states. So how we do that is, is through several strategies, and I'll go into that a little bit later, but first I wanted to talk about how the culture of peace connects to the women's peace and security agenda. Unfortunately, the Global Peace Index has reported that global peacefulness has declined for the fifth year straight due to growing political instability, authoritarianism, on, and ongoing conflict. And this failure for us to cultivate this culture of peace negatively impacts and devastates the lives of millions across the world, if not billions. And as the ambassador said, it disproportionately affects women, youth, and other marginalized groups. In response, Resolution 1325 emphasizes the need for meaningful participation of women in political decision-making and peace processes in order to address these gendered impacts of conflict and work towards conflict prevention and resolution. And the full and equal and meaningful participation of women is essential to having any progress towards achieving international peace and security. <coughs> the culture of peace represents norms, traditions, and values on the practice of nonviolence. And it is that no principle of nonviolence which underlies the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda and Resolution 1325. 1325 is about women's rights. It's about human rights and it's about gender equality. It's not, uh, one of the drafters of 1325 and uh, a strong women's rights activist, her name is Cora White, she said that 1325 is not about making war safe for women. It's about preventing war, preventing conflict, ending war. So that is really, in, in essence, what the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda is. And it has become one of the most important instruments of women's organizing and mobilizing because of this, its ability to put gender equality at the center of thinking on international peace and security. Without gender equality, no country can truly achieve sustainable, inclusive, and just peace. And it is this principle of equality that brings together the culture of peace and the women, peace, and security agenda. As, as I mentioned, 
Convention, we recently conducted a civil society-led research on the UN's sustaining peace agenda, which highlights that peace cannot merely be defined as the absence of war or armed conflict. To women from civil society organizations across the world, human security, development, strong institutions, and harmonious communities relying on nonviolent conflict resolution are all true pillars of peace, rather than just simply the absence of war. So unless a country is able to claim that they have all of those features, they can't say that they're peaceful. Uh, one of the respondents from this research was from Sweden, and they said, my country is not peaceful because we supply arms and we sell arms, so we are furthering conflict in our own way, just as there is conflict in India, for example. So it, it extended, and we had over a thousand responses from 52 different countries, um, including Syria, the Philippines, Canada, Sweden, Colombia, across the world, really. And one of the key findings is that peacebuilding efforts should focus on long-term changes, such as fostering a culture of peace, challenging militarized responses to conflict, implementing sustainable development programs, and guaranteeing access to education and employment. The research also highlighted the important role women play in building and sustaining peace in their communities. When women participate in peace agreement implementation, they ensure that it is implemented at the local level, which is very important. It shouldn't just be a document signed in a capital city and never brought down where the conflict actually is on the local grassroots level. And women also ensure that the, the peace agreement implementation is inclusive and beneficial to all. In the absence of a peace agreement, women work at the grassroots level to advocate and campaign for peace, to deliver relief, and to promote development. Just to give you an example of some of the women we worked with in Torrance, South Sudan, they decided to hold these inter-clan festivals, the community festivals on peace, where they encouraged different foreign clans to come together and play games, play sports, and uh, hold performances on different issues that are very difficult to discuss, perhaps through a form formal setting of dialogue, but were easier to show through theater and through games. And that really built positive dialogue and mutual understanding. And this is just one example of the many, many different ways women have decided to build peace, whether through a formal process or through an informal process. Women tend to raise awareness of the root causes of conflict and address ways in which we can respond to those root causes and therefore effectively build sustainable and inclusive peace and by resolving those root causes of conflict. While there has been significant progress in the inclusion of women in both formal and informal peace processes, there is still a need to ensure that this ex inclusion extends to all women. That means refugees, IEPs, LGBTQIA and non-gender conforming identities, indigenous women, and youth, women with disabilities, the list goes on. We need to ensure that we are truly inclusive when we say women, and that the role of all of these marginalized groups goes beyond being observers and advisors to key influencers and co-decision makers. We at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders work to further the effective implementation of Security Council Resolution 1325, amongst all of these other incredibly important legal instruments, and to cultivate a culture of peace throughout conflict-affected communities across the world. I'll go into some of our strategies, and um, I'll keep them brief, and if you have questions, I can go into further detail later. But our flagship project is called localization. And uh, what we do by that is localization of Security Council Resolution 1325. We take it away from New York, we bring it away from capital cities down to a grassroots level. And the strategy has actually been cited by the Secretary General as one of the key strategies for implementing women, peace, and security in his reports to the Security Council seven years in a row because it is so unique. It's a bottom-up approach based on evidence that local ownership and participation 
results in more effective policy making and implementation. We convene local government, religious leaders, ethnic leaders, indigenous leaders, youth, security sector, and other community members, and essentially all the relevant key stakeholders. And then we begin to discuss why the women, peace, and security resolutions are re relevant in their context. And we start to form concrete actions, such as writing local legislation or local action plans to integrate these resolutions into community development plans. So we have something tangible and sustainable once we've had these discussions and mobilization workshops. Through these multi-stakeholder collaborations and cross-sectoral partnerships, we build local leadership and ownership of peace processes, and therefore the culture of peace and gender equality. I'll give you an example of a localization workshop we did in the Philippines recently. The, the Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao was recently created, and they have, it was created on the basis of a peace agreement called the Maximoro Organic Law. We were in Aliosan of Cotabato, and that is one of the, the key areas of, of this whole transformative process. And we were holding this localization workshop. We asked people, how do you feel about the peace agreement? What, what does it mean to you? And everybody was very reluctant to talk about it, hesitant to support it, and honestly didn't understand it. I was confused. I, I thought this should be the number one topic on everyone's minds. Do we finally have peace after 50 years of war between the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the government? Um, then I went back to my room and realized what, what the issue was. The peace agreement is almost 150 pages long, and it has a lot of incredible gender-sensitive provisions, inclusive provisions, but, but no one is really reading that at all. And so I understood that nobody, nobody had a good grasp on what exactly the peace agreement entailed and why they should support it. So that's something that was missing there, and what, what our response was to first educate the people we had in the room, which were cross-sectoral and, and represented all the different sectors in a community. We told them that this is why you should support the peace agreement. It has, it has provisions for women and youth and indigenous people to participate in this newly formed government and, and religious freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And now it's your responsibility to go raise awareness in other communities and, and build local ownership and support for this peace agreement so that it is truly sustainable. We don't want to go back to war here. We want to support this, this peace agreement, which took a long time to negotiate, but we want to hold it in place and move forward from there. So that's just a tangible example of how, how we build peace through these localization workshops and peace education campaigns, with women, of course, at the center. We also provide support to National Action Plan drafting, which is a government's commitment to, to the women, peace, and security agenda. We gather national stakeholders, including the government and civil society, to identify key women, peace, and security related priorities that should be included in a national action plan. So for example, in Bangladesh, it would be a key, a key priority would be the inclusion of, of challenges that Rohingya women face in the refugee camps in Bangladesh and how those will be addressed. Those, need to, those priorities and challenges need to be included in the national action plan. So that is something that we would raise. We also support national stakeholders to cost and develop a realistic budget for the implementation of the national action plan. Um, a government official in Nepal described a uh, national action plan without a budget as a car without fuel. It's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that there is gender sensitive and gender responsive budgeting to support the implementation of the national action plan. And not only, and once we have those two, two things on the table, the last thing we need is monitoring and evaluation. How do we hold the member state accountable to what they said they will do in the National Action Plan? So that, is a, that, is, that involves developing smart indicators and objectives and framework and results monitoring frameworks and all of those buzzwords which I'm sure you're familiar with to ensure accountability 
and and on, on behalf of the government, and we help civil society measure that and monitor what the government does. And we will build the capacities of the government as well to monitor their own progress, and that's, that's often involves reporting to CEDAW on General Recommendation 30 on peace and security as well. Our last, the last um, key strategy that I will talk about is our work um, to ensure full cycle implementation of 1325 by engaging with young women. So it's through a program called Young Women for Peace and Leadership, where we enhance the capacities of young women to be agents of change through leadership, economic empowerment, peace building, literacy and numeracy, peace, bu peace building, theater, and social media training. And so those are the different components that we give to them. And it's a, it's a lot, it's a very intensive training, after which these young women become, become leaders and peace builders and we find concrete ways for them to engage with on key issues in, in, in their communities. So in, in Indonesia, a key issue is violent extremism. So the young women who we work with in, in communities that are heavily affected by violent extremism and are very vulnerable to radicalization, they work on economic empowerment and as because they see economic exclusion as a key driver of violent extremism. So they respond to that through economic empowerment programs. In Bangladesh, the young women that we work with have been have been running literacy and numeracy education classes for Rohingya refugee women. Out of the 1.3 million Rohingya refugees who are in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, as a result of fleeing genocide from the Rakhine State in Myanmar, 52% are women, and less than 5% have had access to education. They were denied access to education in Myanmar, so they don't, they cannot read Burmese or speak Burmese. And in Cox's Bazaar, they're being denied the opportunity to learn Bangla because the government doesn't want to encourage an assimilation process for them. They want them to return to Myanmar. So the young women that we work with are going into the refugee camps and they're teaching English and, and, and they're providing, they've provided functional numeracy and literacy classes to over 200 Rohingya refugee women over this past year. And by doing that, they've not only empowered themselves to be teachers, to, to stand in the front of a classroom and tell people and take charge, but they've also empowered these, these Rohingya refugee women. And they, the, the biggest change is, has been their own perception of the Rohingya refugee women. When I first talked to them, they said, we don't like the Rohingya women. They bring crime, they bring drugs, they're adding to traffic, and I, we know that they fled genocide, but we're not incredibly sympathetic. But the, since, since the, these classes, they've completely changed their perception and, and are now sympathetic and friends, so they've developed this mutual understanding with the Rohingya refugee women, which, which is just one small, example of how they have now truly embraced the culture of peace in their own minds and passed that on to other women around them. So I will stop there and just conclude by saying that there cannot be a culture of peace without gender equality and without fully recognizing and respecting women's rights. The work on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda and the culture of peace are mutually reinforcing and this should really be the priority for member states, international organizations, for private, for the private sector, for civil society across the world. And this is where we can make the biggest impact. Thank you. Thank you for, um, for bringing it to the ground and the grassroots. And um, I wanted to kind of mention of the 83 national action plans, and I, I hope you know, those of you who don't know who has a national action plan, that it would be your homework to find out. And um, actually only 30, 34 of the 83 have allocated budget mm. for that. So, uh, we have a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for all the localization efforts because I think that's the only way we're gonna do it is to like really push from the bottom up. And I'm gonna, I'm so happy to, 
see Ozzy's with us, um, and she's going to take it over for now. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I apologize for being late, and I want to thank you for uh, facilitating this conversation, and I also want to thank the Ambassador and Monica for your presentation. And I'm just going to say that the takeaway, basically, from, from the conversation is that the stakes for women and girls have never been higher, right? And that uh, in the recent period, we've seen uh, resurgence of right-wing nationalism, uh, abandonment of commitments to human rights and multilateralism in favor of militarism, violence, war, and um, climate chaos. And um, as for me, again, as we localize, you know, you spoke about localization, Malika. I think that for each one of us, it, uh, it's important for us individually and also throughout NGOs to really uh, make a stand against war and for peace and security. Um, and and a number of nations were were mentioned during uh, during both your talks, and I also want to mention the United States, and that the United States is one of the most destructive forces in the last period, and that the U.S. has spent over $15 trillion uh, on war, a massive resource can, that can be supporting meaningful paying jobs, meaningful um, uh, job training, housing, healthcare, uh, child care, and prevention of uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. So we know that $15 trillion could really be spent in making our society uh, and our nation truly um, a peaceful nation. Um, and I think that, again, what we heard is that um, uh, that peace and elimination of war are, are inextricably linked with gender equality, right? that women's leadership on the local level, on the national level, and international level is a necessary ingredient for maintaining peace and security. Again, thank you very much for your, for your presentations, and I think that now we're going to break into smaller groups and have conversations. Um, so we would like you to turn to a, a person next to you, and um, we're gonna give you an opportunity to digest the information that we talked about and, and, and uh, talk about the effects of war in your lives. And what are the, a few steps that you can take individually and what are the steps you can take through your NGO in uh, making a stance against war and working together on the implementation of 1325. Thank you. And we're going to give you about 10 minutes. Uh -huh. Four minutes per woman, and then we're going to come back and see if you have any questions. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk about this and this. Okay. So, yeah, what are your experiences with peace and security and war? Should I like pause or what? I just hold it. Yeah, I guess.
So we're going to come back in a couple of minutes and we want to ask you if you have any questions uh, for each other or for our speaker. Yeah, I hope that is what I'm 